Greetings, folks. Philip Bateman here from Bravo Charlie, and I'm here with Terence Jayaretnam, who is the APAC leader and partner for climate change and sustainability services at EY. And Terence, thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your contribution. Thanks for having me, Philip. And we're talking about a better way forwards, which is the recent research report we're putting together on taking the greenwashing out of ESG and impact investing. And it's an overview of the regulatory initiatives in the Australia, the UK and Europe, and how you can effectively communicate in consideration of those. Um, and Terence, you are looking at your LinkedIn profile. You've got an amazing list of things you're working on. I don't actually understand how you have time to do all of them. Is it all current, like the 10 or 12 positions you currently work on and a number of them are current uh, and uh yeah i i uh i i guess i get them done because i i don't watch as much tv and i'm really boring <laughs> fair enough well i mean i'm not sure you're that boring because what i've got here is you're at the non-executive director for global citizen which focuses on ending extreme poverty you're with um, fair trade australia and new zealand and i know i've seen those fair trade logos on so many of the things i buy though that may be an indication of my consumption habits um food frontiers you're looking at how we sustainably feed the world um, things like plant-based proteins and cell-grown meat. Um, you're also on the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, SASB, which features in our documents. Um, and your monthly column in, in Pro Bono Australia, all the ESG news that's fit to print. How does that sort of like getting across the ESG space base every week? And is it a positive thing? Is it a negative thing? Like, how do you, you know? Yes, the monthly columns are really interesting, I guess, point in that about... 18 months ago, I, I sort of thought, even I can't, and I've been working in this space for 30 odd years, and I, I can't seem to keep in touch with all the things that are happening, both negative and positive. Mm. And I thought, well, at least for myself, I'm going to try and look through the feeds and look at, well, what are the top 10 things that happened that month mm. and document them. And I thought, well, if I'm going to document them, I'm going to I'll publish it so that everyone else gets to read it and and um, get something out of it. So that's how those began. Uh, and then Pro Bono picked it up and, and have started publishing it. Um, and you're right, Philip, there's lots of positives, but there's still lots of bad news. Mm -hmm. um, and the bad news seems to be sort of coming in um, sort of tsunami-like forms uh, at us uh, and, you know, everything from uh, the latest WWF report mm -hmm. on loss of biodiversity through to the extreme events that we're having, uh, you know, particularly in Australia, but all around the world. Mm. Um, we, we seem to be experiencing effects of climate change and other environmental impacts at a much uh, greater rate than we thought we would already. Mm. And I think that's one of the main motivators for why I've basically commission my team and myself to do this work and, and seeking your involvement because I've seen this sort of like hold up of sustainable finance or impact investing as the way to take capitalism, which arguably is the mechanism through which we are experiencing this biodiversity loss uh, and reorientate it towards the sustainable development goals or for, for purpose investments. And as there's been this massive gold rush, essentially, for climate or sustainability aligned funds, there has also been the rise of what's been called semantically greenwashing, uh, which brings us to today. And I was curious, from your perspective, what is greenwashing? Like if we were to break it down as semantic density? Yeah, I guess greenwashing originated as a term about 20 years ago, essentially, uh, pointing to claims that were being made that were inauthentic in terms of their environmental credentials um, and particularly corporate claims when it came to, say, for example, labeling. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where the term originated and eco-labeling um, became a thing. And, and um, you know, products and I guess marketers sought to put labels on to, to give some sort of positive attribute to a product that may not necessarily have a lot going for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's really where things originated. The ACCC picked it up about a decade ago in Australia and sort of said, well, we're going to come after greenwashing claims. And there were there were a couple of cases. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it has started to become, uh, again, a, an issue, as you said, Philip, as the world starts to move towards sustainable funds, impact investing, 
uh, and, and most corporates needing to be socially responsible and needing to show to their customers or B2B clients that they are uh, good corporate citizens and they're abiding by regulations when it comes to environment and climate and that we're now starting to uh, talk about mm. whether um, ESG in, in a sort of a broad context um, has enough guardrails to ensure that the greenwashing is limited and that outcomes are maximized. Mm. Um, so greenwashing um, could occur, as I said, in a corporate context with products or services, um, with the labeling and the claims that might be made. Greenwashing could happen in a financing con context. So we've got um, funds, uh, you know, debt and capital starting to move to sustainable finance. That's one of the mechanisms that banks themselves mm. uh, and financial institutions can become um, net zero over time is to move all of their capital and debt to um, net zero. Uh, and, and if the taxonomy around it isn't consistent uh, and there's inconsistent use of sustainable finance terminology, there could be greenwashing claims there. Mm. Uh, there was a classic case of one of the ports uh, having a stable link loan, but lots of coal going through that particular port uh, and that became a new story. Um, and the third area could be that funds themselves could be sort of greenwashing in that one fund could have one negative screen versus another fund could be a comprehensive impact focused fund with negative and positive screens. And so as you can see, uh, there's inconsistency and, and the market might not see the difference, um, but um, you know, one might be having a very light touch and others could be doing it properly. Mm. And I think that's one of the main reasons why, as you said, there's so much going on in the space, why I've been pushing to get this report out, because as we look across the different measurement frameworks and standards and sort of like push towards some sort of way people can harmonize their reporting, there is just tremendous activity in the space. And, you know, I've spent my life sort of around corporate marketing departments and uh, in fund related marketing departments. And I'm not going to say people are out there trying to, you know, pull a swift one. There's this tension between, you know, where's the market going? What can the comms and the marketing department say on our behalf? What do the the corporate and the institutional leaders want to be communicating? And what are the, what are the customers wanting? And you have this sort of like rolling uh, discussion or at least mechanism trying to meet all of these requirements at the same time as develop global reporting frameworks. So, and the speed at which the market operates these days due to ubiquitous internet is just phenomenal. So, Correct. you know, it's sort of like the perfect storm for for misreporting and, say, and saying things on Twitter that then get blown up and, um, and 10,000 people are on your doorstep saying, hang on. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I you know give due to people who are actually putting the work in to to chip away at the coal face of this stuff, um, or the sustainable eco solar power face, if we're going to call it that. Um, yeah. I digress. So, what is the continued or what is the impact of continued greenwashing to the climate change and sustainability challenges we face? This is as countries, as companies, um, as a species, essentially. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very deep question, Philip, and I guess. Um, referring back to my previous comments about how, um, you know, there's so many sort of um, impacts that are, you know, increasing at a, at a scale that we, we didn't envisage um, so quickly. I, I do, I do um, get worried about how fast companies and financial markets are moving to prevent the, the loss of species and um, the climate change impacts that we, we're seeing. Um, so in that context, um, I don't think greenwashing is helping, um, but that's not, not necessarily, I don't think uh, we can blame any particular stakeholder in that chain. I think there's got to be strong regulation around greenwashing, mm -hmm. and there's got to be strong guidance and guardrails and standards around um, claims and around taxonomy. If we think about you know, how you tackle it as a company or an entity, um, you, you would think that corporate counsel would have some concern about greenwashing claims. Um, you, would, you would think, though, that the communications and media folk would like to say, 
the best things possible about a company or a fund. And it's that natural tension, I think, between um, can we say as much as we can versus what's um, what's allowable. Uh, and that's where companies need to, I think, be authentic in terms of the claims that they, mm. they make um, and ensure that you know directors and, and management are not held liable in, in, in the future in terms of these claims because all these claims um, can be retrospectively reviewed. Uh, and that's one of the things that I, I think is under tested um, still. Mm. Some of the regulatory issues that I think are forming around us, um, there are standards coming. So there's accounting standards that are being developed through the IWSB, which I think will increase rigor around um, you know, potential greenwashing. Um, there is a, a, a standard being developed for Australian, Australian sustainable finance taxonomy, mm -hmm. and that's going to help the sustainable finance work. Um, and there's um, opinions in a legal context out there around um, greenwashing within, say, net zero plans and how directors could be held liable. Mm. So there's a range of, I think, mechanisms and guardrails that are coming. And I think it, it will be harder to greenwash, uh, but we're going through that journey at the moment. One thing I've sort of noticed is that punitive regulatory compliance whilst it may be sporadic um it you know it doesn't drive change it is retrospective and usually the speed at which markets operate things are well done and dusted by the time we get to the punitive regulatory response um and within that what we're putting together here is really a, you know a call to action well what you highlight there in relation to director liability is very important because that also goes with this corporate governance perspective that you know they will come and take your house in the future if you if you if you knowingly or unknowingly because you know ignorance isn't a isn't an excuse in Australia um, or potentially and, and around that, the world and that itself is uh, both positive and negative mm. because I think you then see directors going back in, into their shell to say hang on let's not make any net zero claims yeah. because we could be held liable and um, so. You know, these things, we, we are on a bit of a journey in, in mm. between doing as much as we can from a climate and environmental context through to ensuring the claims are right, through to ensuring that you're protected in making those claims. Mm. And there is a distinction in the report around regulatory environments in Australia, the UK and Europe, because I think the risk avoidance of Australian directors related to our directors and liability insurance and lack of um, lack of ceiling on that if you will as you were suggesting or as you were stating um is inherent in why we've been a bit risk averse for quite a long time yeah. um and those things said the document paints a picture of the regulatory environment and what's developing and then it speaks to theory of change and impact measurement as a way to make legitimate claims about things because they're being measured and I was wondering, what would you encourage firms to consider from across the ESG space? And that's both like single and double material materiality, the theory of change, the impact measurement perspectives um, in how they go about day to day business. Um, well, firms should ensure that um, a their compliance requirements are met around um, ESG and, and broader uh, environmental and social and governance issues. They should then move to well, what might be coming our way and what needs to be adhered to. So that could be the IWSB standards, uh, the the um, carbon board adjustment tax, these things that are coming at Australian companies. How do we start to prepare ourselves um, so that we we uh, are ready for these changes and and the transition that's underway. Um, and then I think you start to think about well, what are our stakeholders wanting from us? Uh, what are invest investors wanting? What are investors telling us? Um, employees telling us through to customer uh, pulse surveys and what are customers and, and suppliers telling us? Mm. Um, and, and beyond which you then need, need to look at, and this is the old Tim Collins saying, is you, know, you, you, you want to be the best in, at what you do. And in order to be the best at what you do, you should be internalizing external impacts and uh, having having some progress 
as you move forward. Um, so you should be comparing yourself to other peers, but locally and globally and ensuring that um, you are getting as good at making widgets yeah. as ensuring that you're as good on climate change and environmental issues. Yeah. I, I noticed something in listening to that and the assumption that everybody wants to go from good to great because like when institutional super funds divest their um, their fossil fuel interests, those get picked up. And I don't know if the people who pick them up are excited about going from good to great from a measurement framework perspective. Yeah. What do we, what do we, what do we say to those people? I, I guess what we say to those people is, um, you know, have, have you, have you considered climate risk in the way you should really be looking at climate risk and, um, you know, we, we are already starting to see write downs, um, big write downs globally and in Australia. So we've had WA and Queensland uh, bring forward coal exits. We've had AGL and Origin talk about um, accelerating coal exit. That is a write down on balance sheets, unless it's already written down, which is unlikely for some of those um, stations like Blue Waters. Um, so the question then is, um, you know, are you seeing the change as quickly as it might be coming at you? Um, I sort of remember this um, photo of uh, one of the avenues in New York in, uh, I think it was 1901 through to 1903, when it was full of horse carriages and one car, mm. up around that 1900s, early 1900s, and a decade later, it was full of cars and one horse carriage. Mm. And, and that's how quickly the shift occurs. And I sort of say to friends and colleagues that, you know, by 2030, we're all going to be driving electric cars. You just yeah. can't see that yet. That transition is coming very quickly. Yeah, I was really struck by the, um, not struck by, I was, I was nice to see your your ESG, um, your blog where one of the points was about air taxis because I've been following those for ages. And then I just saw through um, one of the crowdfunding uh, for the equity crowdfunding platforms for a company who's investing in landing pads all around the place for when the, for when the air taxis get here. Um, and it was just really poignant because I was saying to my partner about, yeah, well, we'll just have like an electric air taxi that takes us around places. And, exactly. you know, if it wasn't... I think I think uh, Melbourne's one of the uh, Uber Air test locations. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But I think Uber Air then sold their, their interest in somebody because the pandemic hit and they were like, ah... Um, so I was like, I'm not going to name names because it'll seem like I'm spooking for them, and I don't want to offer investment advice based on my own <laughs> my own passion for one, for of, the, one of the one think? of the sort of uh, sharing economy things that I've done for a while is car um, car next door, yeah, and they've been bought by Uber, so it's it's become yeah. Uber car share. Yeah, wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and the good car network just got um just got a bucket load of cash from the uh the company backed by mike Cannon brooks that's right and, um, it's good times you know it's like a, the change is rapid um though the the tension here is that for you and i sitting in the middle of melbourne in a very very prosperous nation is how this then flows out to the rest of the world um and we take that change and create you know yeah there's a lot to, there's a lot to be discussed um though i'm and gonna there's, close... a lot, there's a lot to i think educate the developing world that they can leapfrog and not go through all the pain that we've had. And I, I don't think that message is uh, taken by, you know, the, the defects of this world um, as well as it could be. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the microfinance leap with um, cell phones through Africa is tremendous to me. It's like, we don't need, you know, we didn't even learn that. We could have just gone to 5G and not had the NBN or had the NBN. Go straight, five go straight to renewables, go straight to renewables and, yeah. you know, avoid the next power fire, coal fired power station. Yeah, it's a fascinating time. And if there was one thing you wanted people to know about the challenge ahead of us from an economic transition perspective, what would you tell them? Well, so this is not a corporate message, but but mm -hmm. having sort of grappled with this for a long time, I, I do think that personal responsibility uh, has a lot to do with mm -hmm. where we need to go. And I think that if people could shift their patterns, uh, particularly in terms of what they eat. Mm. Uh, and I'm a huge believer with, with my board role in Food Frontier and so on, that plant-based eating is both healthy as well as good for the planet and good for the animals. 
Um, that 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 is a shift that um, we've got to make, as as David Attenborough would would say. Um, but beyond that, just thinking about consumption generally uh, and electrifying your home, uh, mm. because these things are going to going to help um, yourself, I think, with um, personal transition, but also uh, the world at the same time. And it's an emanation as well. If you do those things and you share about them, and then the people around you notice, and they go like, "Oh, oh hey, well, Terence has done that." Jeffrey's done that. Sarah's done that. Why can't we do it? It's um, and it's, yeah. And especially for corporate leaders. I yeah. mean, if we're talking about this stuff and you aren't doing it, well, then you're just talking about it. You're not leading. <laughs> so yeah. pro probably good to lead if you're a leader. Thanks so much for your time and your contribution. I really appreciate it. Great.